are white balance and these are focusing as well. So we're going to have a look at what white balance is, why we should look. learn about it what color temperature is different types of light lighting situation we'll have a look at your auto white balance white balance presets manual white balance and then we'll have a look at focus point selection focus modes and we'll have our summary so you can see we have a lot to get through this evening now i can see some people still asking questions about the advanced course please save those questions for the end we will get to those questions at the end we'll be able to help you out as you can see we've got quite a bit to get through this evening okay so are we all ready guys <laughs> Are we all on the same page? Brilliant. Okay, so let's get down to business. So we've seen this photograph quite a bit uh, throughout this course. It's a, a very good example, all right. But can anybody tell me what's the problem with this particular version of this photograph? Okay, it should be quite obvious if your screen is calibrated. Yeah, there we go, Jean, Kate. Um, yeah, Gina, you're right as well. It looks blue. A lot of people saying it looks blue. It's actually a bit purple. It's kind of magenta purple. So uh, there might be slight variations in, in what everybody says, just down to the, your computer's screens, okay? Um, but yeah, there's definitely a color cast on it. William, you're absolutely spot on there, my namesake. It is actually magenta is what the color is here. A bluish kind of purple, but there is definitely a color cast on it. This is an issue with white balance okay i'm sure we've all taken photographs like this where we're really happy with the shot the exposure is absolutely spot on and perfect but the color is all wrong and you might be like scratching the head well why is this happening and how can i make it uh, how can i correct it and white balance really affects the overall quality feel to your work if you're faced with, like a situation like this where you, again you've got a big responsibility here like photographing a wedding or perhaps photographing a studio shoot and you don't get the the white balance correct you know it can really result in a photograph that you and the client are very unhappy with i mean can you imagine giving somebody back a photograph of their child and they they're looking a little bit like the incredible hulk you know i don't think there'd be too many people that would be very very happy with that so white balance can change the mood and the atmosphere in an image they can make images feel very very cold if there's too much blue in them so in a portrait that's not a nice look you know and sometimes white balance can make an image feel too warm where the people look too orange like this photograph here we have of the wedding where we know that the dress should be white one of the most important things in the photograph is, and especially in a wedding photograph, is the dress. You need to make sure that that's white. So you don't want to have any cast happening in that dress either. Okay, and as we can see with the baby, you know, having the color cast there, you know, it makes the poor baby look a little bit ill. So color has a big, big part um, in the role it plays in our photographs and the, um, I, I suppose, the message that we're playing with it as well. So you definitely don't want to underestimate it. So let's just get right into it. There are many different types of light that we encounter on a daily basis. There are loads of different light sources at any one time, really. We have the light from the sun. We have fluorescent light tubes that might be in your office at work. I'm looking at one here right now. Um, you know, we've got tungsten light that you might have, you know, in your bedside lamp or your ceiling. You've got your flashlight on your camera and so on. All these different light types have what's called a color temperature. Okay, so color temperature um, means that the color of the light that they produce is very, very different. So in various lighting conditions that we would be familiar with, each of these lighting conditions will produce light that's of a different color. For the most part, our eyes and our brain work together to help us deal with these various light sources and constantly makes adjustments so that we see things normally um, instead of the colors that these lights produce. We'll discuss that in detail a little bit more in detail. But 
cameras really don't adapt themselves as well to different light types as our eyes. Okay, so the term color temperature comes from physics. Now, I do want you to pay attention to this part because it can be a little bit confusing initially. Uh, but the term color temperature comes from physics. The different temperature or heat of a light source, um, it, it, the difference in the color it emits, the different colors that light produce are measured on a scale what's called Kelvins, as you can see on screen. So this is called the Kelvin scale. Now, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms of how we discuss it, but the hotter a light source, the colder the light it produces. Okay, so I'll just say that again. This is a little bit to do with physics. But the hotter a light source is, the colder the light it produces. We discuss this in terms of how we see it. So say the image that has a strong red tone from candlelight, this what we would see, we would say this is very, very warm, but it's actually a very cold or a much cooler uh, temperature of um, light. Okay, the best example of this is, uh, yeah, Prince, you're just saying that's weirdly confusing. Okay, so the best example of this is, how many of you did science back in, um, in high school or in secondary school or, you know, or just familiar with Bunsen burners? Or perhaps you're familiar with a welding flame. If you have any welders out there, you might be familiar with a, um, a welding flame. If we remember the Bunsen burners, when we, um, when we had the temperature very low on a Bunsen burner, we got a very bright orange flame. But what happened when we increased the temperature of the Bunsen burner, or we increased the temperature of our welding tool, of our soldering iron? What color does it become? Yes, James, you're spot on. It goes blue. It turns to blue. So the actual, the higher temperature went to the flame actually turned to blue. This is the exact same way that light temperature works, the color of light works. So we just need to be aware of this as photographers. So we will also usually talk about color temperatures in the way that we see them. As I mentioned a minute ago, the warmer the light, the colder the color it produces. But we will probably forget this. And as photographers, we generally stick to just describing them visually, which is just easier for photographers. Okay. So if you have a warm glow coming from a fire, we will say that's a warm image. Whereas if it was a cold winter's morning and we saw a very blue sky, we would say that's cold, even though the opposite is true. Does that make sense? It's, I know it's a bit of a contradiction. So basically, the physics behind it is that um, like a clear blue sky is actually of a much higher color temperature. But for the sake of easiness for photographers, we would say it's a cold, it's a cold looking photograph. So it's kind of the opposite, but it is important to understand the physics behind it. I know it sounds like a bit of a contradiction, okay? So color temperature refers to the light of uh, different sources. So some light sources can be very warm. Some light sources can be balanced or neutral, like the midday sun here, daylight. And some uh, different color temperatures can affect your images differently as they create a wash of their particular color over your entire images. And the colors and the tones don't get represented naturally okay so I know like I said it's a little bit of a contradiction um, so we maybe do go over that part of the lesson in the recording if you're not too sure about that but as we kind of continue on I'll be referring to warm images as warm images okay <laughs> even though we know that they've got a colder light temperature so <laughs> it's one of the most confusing with photography um, you know but we kind of say what we see as photographers just to make things a little bit easier for ourselves so different light sources and even different times of the day create different color casts in your image and this can be seen as a positive or a negative thing probably more negative in most cases as we'll see later on but you can also take control of color temperature and you can use it creatively as well but before I look at different color temperatures I just want to talk about the term daylight Daylight is a term in photography, not just the time of day. And daylight refers to an image that has no color cast. No color cast. Daylight is when there is no color of in the light that is falling on the scene. It is a neutral light. Okay, daylight is white light, and therefore when it falls on the subject or scene, 
all the colors in the image look correct because they're not contaminated by colors in the light source. And we'll be looking at examples of this, so don't worry if this is a new concept to you now. Okay, so does everybody understand all of that for the moment? Brilliant. Great stuff. Fantastic. So let's have a look at some examples that will become a little bit more clear for us. As I said, as I say all the time, we are visual creatures. We just make a lot more sense of it when we actually see some examples of it. So here we have an example of an image that's shot under white or neutral light or daylight. Daylight, okay? So basically the light doesn't contain any contaminating colors. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. There is an obvious way to identify whether the photograph has a contamination of colors. Can anybody tell me what it is? So it's a bit of a tricky one. So, Anna, you're so are Liam, you're saying skin? No, you're, no you're, 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 it's, a good, it's a good one, Liam, but it's not, it's not the answer I was looking for. Michael, you're absolutely spot on there. Katrina, you're spot on there as well. And I can see Monica, you're saying there as well. You want to check the whites. If your whites are white, then all other colors in the photograph are going to be free of contamination. So if there is no contamination in your whites and they look nice and white, um, that would be generally a good indication that you have no contamination of any colors in your photograph. Like we can see here in this particular photograph, you know, there's a lot of white in it. It's very, very simple to identify it. Now, one of the most common lighting conditions that we would find ourselves in is fluorescent light. So fluorescent light is something we experience in our offices, industrial buildings and so on. And this covers a broad range of colors uh, from about 4,000K up to about 7,000K. But the most common is the greenish blue found up to 7,000K. Now, can everybody see that in the uh, lab coat here, that there's a little bit of a cast of a kind of greeny blue, almost like an aqua. Yeah, so that's, again, you want to try and find something that's white in the photograph to identify if there is a contamination in it. And fluorescent light is a very, very tricky one uh, to deal with. Now, a lot, I always get asked the question at this stage as well, what about LED lights? What kind of color, color temperature range are they going to be? They're going to be very, very similar. LED lights will give you a similar cast as well. Usually it comes out a little bit more bluer, but it is a very, very similar range that you're going to get on this too. Okay, so again, looking at the whites, and we can see if we have a look at the kind of, you know, the 4,000 to 7,000 range, it's quite a broad range, but it's usually up at around the 7,000 kind of range, and we can see that's falling in blue on the scale. So candlelight is, as we saw, is a cold light source, but as photographers, we would say that this is a warm image between 1500K and 2000K, and it produces a very strong red or orange tone across the image. Now, this can be quite atmospheric in depending on the shot. This would be an example where having that um, nice kind of uh, uh, orange glow in the photograph actually adds a little bit to the photograph. Okay, now Susan, you're saying it's too orange, maybe just a little bit too much, but it definitely can be seen a little bit more positive, positively here compared to the previous photograph where you don't want that kind of greenish blue look to the shot. Now, the issue here is that with these kind of photographs, we have no idea of identifying what the colors should actually be. And that's if we have a look at the wall. So the example, the way I would always look at this is, I cannot tell looking at this photograph what color that wall should actually be. I have no indication, I have no point of reference of what that color that wall should be. To me, it just looks like it's a light kind of orangey color. But for all I know, that wall could be white or could be gray. We have no way of knowing because the white balance is incorrect. Does everybody understand that? So some other colors in the photograph might have contamination in them. And because we don't know what the original color was going to be, it can be a little bit difficult to work with. But we will have a look at how to um, correct all of this a little bit later on as well. Now, morning sun would also be a very similar uh, kind of range in terms of the Kelvin scale. Um, but this is, a, again, a really, really nice kind of positive spin on the white balance. And we can see here it's got a really lovely kind of orangey 
golden tone to it at about 2,500 kelvins, um, and it produces strong oranges in the um, in the image. And we can see that very very clearly in the clouds. You know, generally clouds are kind of a light kind of grey, um, and we can see the very very clearly the cast in that as well. But again, this is what we would consider a positive, um, you know, a positive effect of white balance in the photograph as it gives it a really kind of rich um, kind of sun. It could, with some early morning sun in this case, but you know, you get the same type of effect when the sun is going down as well. And quite often I get asked by students, how can you get deeper uh, oranges in your photographs when it comes to sunsets? And this is one way to do it as well, is by changing your white balance. And we'll have a look at how to do that later. Charles is saying he's lost his sound. Guys, can everybody still hear me? Excellent. Everybody can still hear me there. That's okay. Charles, I hope that sound comes back for you now in just a moment. So we'll have a look at how to change the white balance a little bit later on as well. Now, one of the situations that I find to be most problematic myself, and it's one that uh, really bothers me, is tungsten light. And tungsten light produces, as you can see here, very, very strong yellow tones in the photographs. But it is one of the most common situations we will find ourselves shooting in as well. Tungsten lights can vary in intensity, but usually they fall around 3,000 kelvins upwards, and it produces these strong yellow and orange tones that we are used to seeing. Now, the issue with this as well is that while they can make a photograph look nice and warm and inviting, for example, if you are photographing interiors or something like that, it can be a really nice effect to have in it. If you're photographing something like a portrait like this, it's definitely something that's undesirable. You really, really don't want to see something like this. So being able to understand the white balance, to correct that is really going to be important. Yeah, will, yeah, will you? My namesake again there, will you say it's not realistic? Absolutely. It's not an accurate representation of skin tone. So we definitely need to work on, uh, would need to be working on something like this. Now, with colder temperatures, from about 6,500 kelvins, the colder temperature starts to look very, very cold. And as you can see here um, in this particular photograph, we have a lot of blue light in the shot. This will get a lot of this will, like we'll get a lot in very really cold situations and in lots of snow scenes. And it can be quite nice, you know. I actually quite like this particular photograph, but it's not technically correct. Okay, it's not technically correct. What color should the snow be, guys? <laughs> I know it's, it's probably the easiest question anybody is going to ask you. Uh, but yeah, exactly, Jason, Carl, Mike, Anthony, Fiona, uh, Olivia. It should be white. It should be white. It shouldn't be blue. Now, this can be a creative effect. You know, this is a subjective thing. You might like to put that little bit of blue in the photograph as well. And this is artistic license that you may have that we have as photographers but if we're trying to accurately represent the scene you know we should be trying to accurately represent the tones and the colors and that's we would need to try and get snow white so how can we take control of the white balance well your first option is going to be auto white balance so if you've ever seen this on your camera awb and wondered what it stands for it stands for auto white balance this is the process where your camera constantly calibrates or adjusts itself to, to different color temperatures for different lighting conditions that you are in. By default, your camera is probably using this auto white balance mode. And most white balance systems do a really, really good job. Helena, you're saying you can't see it on your camera. Do check your camera's manual to see where it is located. It's usually located somewhere in the camera's menu, okay? So auto white balance is going to be generally your default setting on your camera. So how does it work? Well, in terms of technology, how white balance works is actually very difficult to get information on because most cam camera manufacturers keep the specifics of their systems a trade secret. They're actually all a little bit different from each other, okay? But it's usually based on the idea that the camera will look for the brightest object or tone in your photograph, and it assumes that this is white, okay? So it assumes that whatever the brightest object or tone in your image 
um, it, it is, it'll assume that it is white. And it will then choose a white balance setting to make sure that this object or tone is free of color. So, and if the white is white in your image, then the color cast will be removed. And when it's removed, it will be removed from all other objects in the photograph as well. Now, with this system, does anybody want to tell me what would be the problem here? Okay, so it assumes that the, um, the, the brightest object is white in the photograph. So what might be the problem with that? Okay, so it's a bit of a tough question. Helen, yeah, you're absolutely right there. Carol, you're spot on there as well. Renee, yeah, you're absolutely right there. Excellent stuff, guys. And Michael, if nothing is white, if there's no white in, in the photograph, how does the camera know it's white? It's only assuming that the brightest object in the shot is white. And it, as, as someone's just said there, it isn't always white. Okay, Vanessa has just said that there. If it isn't always white. Now... That's an extremely simplified version of what is going on in a very complex um, uh, situation or a very complex thing that's working within your camera. And generally, the white balance, the auto white balance in your cameras will actually do a very, very good job. But for most situations, auto white balance will, get, will do the job for you. And it's the one that I would tend to use the most myself. The main thing to understand is that as lighting conditions change and you shoot under different lighting conditions, your camera needs to re-white balance and most of the time the auto white balance will do this for you. But there will always be times when it just doesn't work, when it just doesn't get it correct. And as your photography skills develop, it'll be another thing for you to keep an eye on and understand what is going on. And you need to have the ability to make adjustments if things are going wrong. So. Here is an, uh, the photograph we saw a little bit earlier on as well. And here is the auto white balance has been used to help correct the photograph. Now, we can see here the image on the left um, has no white balance in it. We have that kind of, um, that aqua -y kind of look to it. And the image on the right, the auto white balance has made a change. And we are, you're saying there's a big difference there. We can see it uh, very, very clearly there. Now, personally, I have to say, I don't think the, the whites are as white as they could be, but this is certainly much more acceptable um, as a photograph to us compared to the other shot. Now, uh, Sue, you're saying it's still a little bit cool. I would say it's a lot more balanced, a lot more, um, a lot more daylight balanced, okay? If you are seeing little bits of color casts on it, do bear in mind that your uh, monitors may display these images ever so slightly differently. So, you know, we could have 20 different monitors and the skin tones and, and the tones of the coat could be ever so slightly different on every single monitor. So do allow for that as well. But basically, I think we all agree that this is a lot more acceptable than the previous photograph. And yeah, and Prince, you've just said it there again. Uh, wonderful name, Prince. I have to say, you've just said it there again. Uh, his skin looks much more healthier and warmer now. Brilliant. Now, so what about these op uh, situations where the auto white balance just does not get it correct? Well, when the white balance gets it wrong, we do have these preset modes that are available to us as well as a fallback. Remember, the main thing to be aware of is that you have changed uh, lighting conditions. Light is constantly changing. I've said it before, we're always chasing light. We're chasing light in terms of exposure. But now you also need to, to consider chasing light in terms of its color as well. And this is all part of developing your technical skills and your awareness of lighting conditions. However, most of the time, um, you'll, you'll just think, you've, I've changed lighting conditions, but I'm still going to stick with the auto, and hopefully that will do a good job for me. So a lot of the time, the auto white balance will still do a really, really good job for you when the light changes. So an example might be when you are out on a sunny day shooting, but you spot something in a shaded area. Now, maybe under a roof or a canopy. Now, this is a lighting change, and therefore the white balance is going to change. Now, again, you might just say, I'll stick with the auto and I will be fine. The reason I'm using shade as an example is that it is often a lighting condition that auto just doesn't get quite right. So as we have seen, the camera goes ahead and calculates a white balance on what it thinks the color temperature is. And then it picks a Kelvin value, say 7000K, and changes itself to that to compensate for the different colors of light. A preset is simply just a preset temperature or Kelvin value that you can set the camera to. 
And these presets are just common lighting conditions that can be drawn up if the camera gets it a little bit wrong. So let's just have a look at some examples of this. So here is an image of a very happy guy taken under a slight shady condition with the camera set to the auto white balance. Now it might seem pretty much okay, but there's not something quite right about the way the tones have been captured. Okay, does anybody want to tell me what they think about the tone in this photograph? So we've shot this at a, pre a shaded preset. Clara, yeah, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, yeah, Leanne, you're, you're spot on there as well. Monica, Isaac, yeah, Elvira, yeah, excellent. It's a little bit cold. It's a little bit blue. So that's affected the skin tone. So for me looking at this, he just isn't as healthy looking as he is in real life. And this is a much colder tone in the image that was there at the time. So really what is happening here is the auto white balance has just made the image a little bit too cold by picking a Kelvin value that just wasn't quite right. And in this case, because I can see it's not quite right and the auto white balance hasn't worked, I can fall back on one of my presets. Now, as I mentioned, presets are just a predefined Kelvin value that you can pick if you know the lighting condition you are in. And yeah, you'll usually try to pick them if the auto is failing you. So let's have a look at this. We'll select a different mode on it. Okay. Okay, guys, I've actually made a slight error there. This should have said daylight rather than shade. Okay, my apologies about that. So does everybody understand that that's actually incorrect? That should have said daylight <laughs> instead of shade. And I'm about to change it to shade instead. So my apologies about that. It was a slight error on my part. So now we've changed it to shade, <laughs> okay? So now we've changed it to shade and we can see the difference there now, okay? Yeah, Mia, yeah, you're just saying makes much more sense now. Yeah, I was wondering what was going on there myself. My apologies about that. So the previous one was daylight. We've now changed it to shade. Now we can see the difference, it's much better. You can see the color temperature or the white balance of the image has changed. He looks much warmer in tone and much healthier and more vibrant and perhaps even a little bit happier as well. The tones are much closer uh, uh, resembling to what he should really look like. So shade as a preset has done a better job than the daylight in this situation. So let's just have a look at the two images side by side. So can everybody see them? You can see the difference very, very clearly now, really. Yeah, there we can really see that. We can really see the difference in the image on the left. Um, is much colder than the one on the right, as we were saying. It appears a little bit bluer in tone, but now we've got one, even the background color is looking a lot better as well. There's a lot more separation from him against the background. We have a nicer color in the background too. Um, it looks just a lot much warmer. It looks like there's actually road, uh, blood running through his veins rather than the one on the left. So this is a situation where change from the uh, daylight and um, preset moving into the shade preset has done a much better job for us. Stacy, you're asking, would shade be the same as cloudy? They'd be very similar, but not identical. So, you know, you do need to be a little bit careful with them. But let's have a look at some of these other presets um, as well. Now, the daylight preset here is a preset for what is considered a common daylight temperature or Kelvin value. And this preset usually falls around the uh, 5200 mark, but it can go all the way up as uh, 6500K, depending on your manufacturer and camera. Daylight is usually what the camera is trying to achieve in auto mode anyway, but this is a preset and um, is there for when auto is still not getting it quite right. But you can see these other options, we have tungsten, we have cloudy, fluorescent, we have flash as well. But then we have this option called Kelvins. And we'll speak about Kelvins in just a moment as well. So as your photography skills develops and you understand white balance more, you will begin to notice and consider the slight difference between the color and tones in your images. You'll also begin to see slight shifts in um, uh, you get from all the white balance and may want a more consistent white balance in your images. When you get to this point, you will probably start considering manual white balance. So we can set our white balance manually as well. Manually, manual white balance is a much more accurate way of telling the camera exactly what Kelvin setting is needed for the scene. Now, how it works is that we use this device here called a gray card. 
and Stephen, you were just asking, what's that device in front of the camera? This is called a grey card, and it's been a tool that photographers have used for decades. A very, very useful tool that we can use for setting exposure, and we can use for setting white balance. Now, we won't talk about it in terms of exposure at the moment, um, but we will talk about it in terms of white balance. Now, Edgardo, you have pointed out uh, you've, you've spotted it there. There is a slight error with what she's doing here. We won't speak about that just for the moment, but really well spotted. But we'll just explain what it does first in terms of setting our white balance, okay? So with this, to use a grey card, is that you would put it in the scene under exactly the same lighting as your subject in, which is exactly what she's not doing here. So she's actually using this incorrectly. But you would put it in the scene where your subject is, okay? You photograph the grey card, and then through your camera's custom white balance menu, you'll be asked by the camera what image you would like to use for the custom white balance. You select the image of the grey card and the camera will go ahead and assess the picture and decides what Kelvin value is needed to correct the colour temperature in the image of the grey card. Now, I'll just run through all of that again. It sounds like a complicated process, but it's actually very, very straightforward. So you place the grey card in your scene. You take a photograph of the grey card. In your white balance options, you will see an option called custom white balance. When you select custom white balance, it will go into your photographs. It will ask you to select the photograph with the grey card in it. You select the photograph with the grey card, and when you've done that, it will correct your white balance for you. So every other photograph you take will then have the correct white balance. Does that make sense? Perfect. And so Patty and Wean, you, you both asked the same question. So should the grey card be on the couch? Yes, it should be because the light source is coming from the window. So this is, I actually like using this example uh, because it shows when you saw, see somebody sh doing something wrong, <laughs> you, know, you know what way it should be done instead, if that makes sense. But because the light is actually coming from the window, really the grey card should be placed. One of the children perhaps would hold it. You'd photograph the grey card. Then you select your custom white balance and then you can set it off it. Mia, you're asking, is this a must tool? No, not at this stage, but they are very, very useful for the future because there is another function that grey cards, um, you can use them for, which is to um, correct white balance in post-production and also to set your exposure from as well. But this is something that's a little bit more complex. For the moment, we just want to understand them in terms of taking the photograph um, with the grey card to set our white balance. So Pan, can you use white paper instead? You can. That's something that you'd actually use much more when you're doing video uh, rather than doing uh, photographs. So it's best to stick with the grey cards when you're doing photography. But if you are doing video, you can actually, it's the exact same process if you're doing it that way as well. Okay, so I also mentioned if we have an issue with cutter cast afterwards, um, you may have seen these guys before as well. And we can correct white balance in post-production too. And a lot of people were asking that, is this something that we can correct afterwards? It is possible. So if we have an issue with a cutter cast in our image, which is essential to a colour coming um, out correctly. We are in total trouble if we don't get it completely right in the camera. So if we haven't got it right at the time of the exposure, there is a way of correcting it afterwards. And that is by using colour cards and grey cards as well. I always encourage people to learn as much as possible about their camera first and shoot the best images as possible so that you don't spend all your time fixing problems with your image. So say that there, there may be times you just cannot get it right in camera and you, you, or the image doesn't actually have a white or grey point in your image for the camera to reference and make an accurate white balance from. This is where the grey card comes back into play. Rather than taking a picture of it and setting a custom white balance in the camera, you also have the option to photograph a grey card in the scene and use this as a reference um, for white balance later on in programs like Lightroom and Photoshop. So you can actually use this as a reference at a later stage. Basically how it works is that the subject, like here, would hold 
the grey card or the colour card in this particular case. You can see there's lots of greys on this as well. And you would photograph this. So when you bring the photographs then into your, uh, your Photoshop or into Lightroom, you can simply click on the grey. This will correct the white balance for you. And you can use this as a reference point for other photographs that are taken in similar lighting conditions. Okay, does that make sense? Now, Billy is just asking, can one photograph a grey wall if you don't have a grey card? Absolutely, you can uh, if you wish, but it may not be 100% accurate. Manuel, you're asking, why a grey card though? Well, grey cards are actually called 18% grey cards. Where have we heard 18% before? Okay, so just waiting for some answers to come in on that one. Exactly, it's the, the amount of light that's coming into the camera. It's the reflected light that's coming into the camera. So grey cards are actually calibrated for your camera's light meter. And that's why they are perfect for setting your exposure and your white balance from. That's why they are grey. 18% grey, just like your 18% that your light meter is calibrated for. So these why they're very, very good for setting your white balance and your exposures and so on. So does that make sense? Are we a little bit clearer on the white balance? Brilliant. Now, I would say, you know, your white, your auto white balance really is going to be the one that you're going to be relying on the majority of the time. But your presets do come in useful as well. And if you get a little bit more confident with it, you may decide that you want to start setting your custom white balances as well. Okay, but certainly auto white balance for the moment in the majority of the time will do you a good, uh, will do a very, very good job. Helena, you said you found your presets. That's great. Okay, so get used to using them. Test them out as well. Take a photograph on each different preset and have a look at how um, the, each of those presets affects the photographs and the colors that it produces. Because white balance can be used in a creative way as well. It, you know, you can use it to influence a photograph. You, can, you know, if you want to make a photograph a little bit cooler, if you want to make a photograph a little bit warmer for creative or artistic purposes, you now have the option of doing that as well okay so moving on to the next part of the lesson and um, we have our focusing focusing is one quest is an area of photography I get asked all the time about how do I get sharper images okay how many people struggle with their focusing in their photography Yeah, I see lots and lots of yeses coming in. Alan, Jennifer, Elaine, uh, Juliet, Walter, you're saying sometimes. Sometimes is a really good answer, Walter, because focusing is a temperamental thing. And so it can be really, really frustrating uh, in some situations, particularly situations where you haven't got a lot of light, uh, where the camera's autofocus struggles and it's always doing the zzz, zzz, zzz and zooming in and out and you just can't get it. And it's maddening, absolutely maddening. So we will have a look at how to improve our focusing right now. So we've seen this guy before. So we said we talk about focus again in this lesson. And for the most part, I'm assuming that most of you guys have been using autofocus. Would that be a correct assumption? Now, I did see some people saying manual focus as well. But um, most of the time, we are going to be using autofocus. Autofocus is very reliable in the most part and generally does a great job. Now, just in case you were unsure, when you press your shutter button halfway down, the autofocus mechanism starts to work and the camera begins to focus. Typically, it will indicate to you in the viewfinder with a solid circle that it's in focus. Now, it might have something slightly different to indicate to you uh, what the focus is um, exactly. But generally, on most cameras, it's going to come up as a solid red dot that will tell you that the image is in focus. Unless you have it switched off, most cameras will also have an audible beep to let you know that the image is, is in focus as well. And the beep is extremely useful as it allows you to be reassured that you're in focus without having to keep checking for the circle, especially uh, if the camera is on a tripod or some other position uh, where you're not looking through the viewfinder. 
The only time the beep can be an issue is if you're in a very quiet place, perhaps you're in a church, um, you know, and you might cause a disturbance. Or if you're doing, if you're photographing a performance or something like that as well, you can imagine being in a theatre. In those situations, you, you want to switch the beep off in your camera's menu. Otherwise, it is an excellent feature to use. So when we use autofocus, we choose where we want the camera to focus. If we choose the wrong place, then our image will be soft or blurry or the wrong area of the photograph will be in focus. Let's, let's break this down. When you press the shutter halfway down, the autofocus goes to work and you hear the beep and you will temporarily see some squares light up. How many, how many of us have seen something like this, where you've got these little squares, you see them going red when you slight, lightly press that shutter button down? We've all seen this. Brilliant. Typically, these will light up in red. Some cameras, they may light up in green. These area squares that have lit up in red are the areas that the camera has chosen to focus from. Sometimes we'll say this is where they've pulled the focus from. Your camera may not have as many points as this, but the same principles apply. In this particular scene, the autofocus has gotten it right, and we can see in these focus points sit on top of the subject I want it in focus. Autofocus is a very complex thing for the camera to get right. In any given scene, there could be a lot of objects uh, for the camera to try and focus on. The autofocus system has to try and figure out what object or subject is supposed to be in focus and then quickly make adjustments to get that object in focus. When autofocus is trying to, to figure out what to focus on, it actually doesn't know what you want to focus on. It will generally pick um, a depth to focus at rather than a particular object or subject. Okay, and because um, this subject is closest to the camera, that's where it's chosen to take its focus from. So in this case, it has decided to focus on the object that's about half a meter into the scene. So in this particular shot, anything that's on the same plane as the eagle will be in focus, such as the girl's hand. Okay, but because the girl is at a different distance, she's not in focus. So when using autofocus, you need to always have a quick check to make sure that a focus point is lit up on the subject you want in, um, and, uh, in focus and not on an object behind you. So how can we do that? How can we be sure that we are selecting the correct area to focus on? So here we have a scene um, with different subjects. We've seen this before and they are at different distances from the camera. If I wanted to say shoot this with a shallow depth of field where I want to isolate a particular subject at a certain distance. So I'm going to use autofocus and say I want to pick the second guy in line. How can I do that? How will the camera know I want him in focus? Well first let's see what happens if we use standard autofocus. What do we think is going to happen if I use the standard autofocus in this particular shot guys? Where do you think it's going to focus from? Okay, Kim, you're asking, how can I focus on the lady? We'll look at that in just a moment. Some people are saying it'll focus on everybody. We'll think about it. A lot of people are getting it there now. It will focus on the person that's closest to the, uh, the camera, to the lens. And we can see that here exactly. So when we press the shutter, we, halfway down, the camera begins to focus on the scene. Finds a few points and the girl closest to the camera lights up the points and this is the focus it's going to use. Okay, generally it's going to try and pull its focus from the person or the object that's closest to, this, to, your, to you, to the camera. So we take the picture and sure enough the girl is in focus. Anything that's the same distance as the girl from the lens would be in focus as well. But because everybody else is further behind, and because we are using a shallow depth of field, remember we are using a shallow depth of field here, everybody else is out of focus. So how do we stop the camera from keeping its focus on the girl? We want that guy who's second in line to be in focus. Well, in this case, um, we, it will keep going to those points at the girl. If we keep trying to use the autofocus here, it's going to keep selecting her. So. Each one of these black squares is a potential focus point that the camera's autofocus system could use. Rather than allowing the camera to select the points for us, luckily the camera allows us to choose which point to focus from as well. 
So, focus point selection allows you to select the point that best suits the camera, uh, or sorry, best suits the subject you want in focus. Like a lot of the functions on your camera, you will need to go digging into your camera's user manual firstly to see if you have it, and then how to adjust it. But it's a very, very common feature, and it's usually very easy to locate and straightforward to adjust. So what this does, it allows you to pick one of the various squares here as a point to set focus from. When you use this function, you will only see one square light up rather than multiple ones. Usually when you're trying to select a point, it will be highlighted in red and either using the wheel or the directional button, you will be able to select and move the um, various focal points around. So let's have a look at this. So in this case, I want to pick up points on the second subject in the scene. Then, as usual, I press my shutter button halfway down and the camera will focus on this guy instead. We can see very clearly the red focus point is now highlighted. When I take the shot, he is now in focus. And because I'm using the shadow depth of field, I get him isolated in the scene. So using the focus point selection, I've been able to shift the point of focus from the girl further back to the guy behind her. Again, in this shot, I'm using a very shallow depth of field. So everything behind and in front of this guy is out of focus. If you want everybody in focus, you could use a deeper depth of field. The main thing that's going on here is that I'm able to override what the auto focus was choosing as the subject to focus on. This is extremely useful when autofocus keeps getting it wrong for you. So if you find it just keeps going to the wrong place, you can simply override it and you can choose where you want to focus from. Now, let's look at one more example so you can get your heads around this. Now, again, this is a function that you will need to test out and play around with, okay? But if we were to move the focus point all the way over to the right in this case, and we've selected the lady third in row here, and we've changed the square there to highlight her. Now this girl is in focus. And again, we've used a shadow depth of field and it gives us that nice isolating effect. Things to note with focus point selection is that once you shift that point around, it will stay on that point. So you do need to change it afterwards. So is everybody still with me? Brilliant, fantastic. Great stuff, great stuff. Now, that's really, really useful to be able to select your focus points will help you to overcome lots of various situations. But what's the problem with select focus point selection, guys? Can anybody give me an instance where it might be a little bit of an issue? Yeah, Mark, you're absolutely spot on there. It's slower. It's much slower. You can imagine if you're in a, um, and yeah, sports is a good example of it. Mentally, you're a good example there as well. If somebody is moving, if the subject is moving, Derek, same thing, moving targets. Anything that's very fast, it's going to be difficult to try and implement this technique into that. Okay, so we'll have a look at some techniques that will allow us to deal with those types of situations. Now, so switching back to multi-point selection. So just imagine we've gone back to multi-point selection. We've, we've gone out of our, um, of our focus point selection and we're going to let the camera choose the focus point instead again. Now, focus point selection is great for picking a particular area in your image and focusing from that point. But as we've just said, it can be slow, it can be time consuming to have to stop and readjust the focus point until it's over your subject. So what a lot of photographers do, including myself, and this technique I have to say is one of the most invaluable techniques I've ever learned. So what I would do is that set the focus point to the center and leave it there. This is called center point focusing. Okay, so again, you can do this by setting through the focus point selection menu and select the center square. This will ensure that the lens always focuses from the center of the frame. Now, you're probably thinking, well, that's no good if the subject is not in the center. In these situations, rather than changing the focus point, you are going to move the camera until the subject you want is in the center. Focus on the subject and then recompose the scene back to the original com uh, composition you wanted. So we'll just run through that again. So we select our center focus point. 
We move the camera until the subject we want is in the center. You lightly press the shutter button to focus on that subject. You then recompose the scene back to the original composition you wanted and you take the shot. So let's see how that works. So I move the camera to the lady here in front. I want to focus on her. So I move the camera to the girl. Once I lightly press my shutter button, it takes the focus from her. I keep the, the shutter button lightly pressed. I keep the shutter button lightly pressed. I move the, the um, composition back the way that I want to. And I take the photograph and voila, she is in focus. It's locking the focus. Okay, um, Gary, you're asking, how can I focus on manual without this? Well, if you're shooting in manual focus, you're going to be just manually focusing it that way, Gary. Just make, remember to make the distinction, guys. Your autofocus is not connected to your auto mode on your cameras. So you can shoot in fully manual mode and still use autofocus on your lens. Okay, they're not connected in terms of exposure at all. So you can use your manual option on your camera to set your exposure, but you can still use autofocus to set your focus. Does everybody understand that? It's the same on a film camera as well, Richard. If your film camera has autofocus option, this technique is the exact same. So as long as you don't take your finger off the button, the camera will hold the focus until you take the shot. This is like pre-focusing essentially. It's very, very fast. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's incredibly fast. And when you do get to that stage, um, it's really very good technique. So um, somebody, Vicky, you're asking, just repeat that. And um, Uma, you're asking to repeat that as well. So I will. So I'll just go back two slides here. So I select my center focus point. Okay, I move my camera to the subject that I want to be in focus. I center her. I lightly press my shutter button. That will lock the focus on her. I recompose my shot back to the center and I take the photograph and there I have it. She's in focus and um, you know, it hasn't tried to select focus from anywhere else in the shot. Now, that's still a really, that's a great technique. But it's still not the best technique if you're photographing uh, something that's very fast moving. Now, you will need to check your camera's manuals for this as well because your focusing modes, your fast focusing modes um, are going to have slightly different names depending on your camera. The ones that I have here, servo mode and AFA, that's Canon and Nikon. But there's probably a little bit different if you've got a Pentax or a Sony or a Fuji, they may call it something slightly different. So servo mode or AFA autofocus mode, these are focus tracking modes. So you put your camera in servo mode, you focus on the subject and the camera will identify the moving subject and continuously refocus as the subject moves. It will track the subject as you move uh, with them through the scene. Never locks the focus, so you'll never get that beep. So just be aware of that. It's constantly readjusting the focus. It's tracking your subject when you're moving uh, with them as well. So a situation like this, if you're photographing somebody running, you'd be moving the camera as they're running as well. You have your camera in, a, in servo mode or in AFA mode, and you track and follow that subject and you take and it'll generally keep them very, very nice and sharp. So this is the mode that you're going to use for any fast moving subject. Marcin, you're saying the mode on Pentax is simply called C, called C on a Pentax. OK, so do investigate that on your camera's manuals as well. Um, it's very, very useful for photographing. Jackie has just said it there for photographing kids, for photographing children. This is the one I get asked all the time. Really very, very useful. Combine this with your fast shutter speeds and you'll see a dramatic improvement in the quality of your fast moving photographs. Okay, great stuff. And you can use this for a moving car as well. And absolutely, that's a good example of that as well. Now, we covered a lot this evening, guys. <laughs> it was a lot to try and get through tonight. So I strongly recommend, as always, go over the, um, this lesson when it goes into your student login area tomorrow. But we have been able to correct the white balance in our photographs. Everything is looking a lot more natural. We're not going to have any unhappy brides or any unhappy parents of children now because we have our uh, white balance correct. 
Now we also have our uh, focus correct now as well. We looked at a couple of different focusing techniques and um, we have everything nice and sharp hopefully going forward as well. Okay, so just to summarize everything that we've covered this evening, we had a look at why we should learn about white balance. We had a look at color temperature, different types of lighting situations, auto white balance presets. We had a look at manual white balance, focus point selection, focusing modes, and God, that was everything. It was a huge amount to fit in tonight.